webinar at the October 9th History Bites Zoom lecture, um, welcoming Mr. Philip Johnson by remote Zoom. Mr. Johnson grew up in Springfield, but he has roots in the Amherst area. His mother's family comes from Leverett, and they went to high school in Amherst. And my immediate question is, which high school did they go to? Was it the one on Lessie Street, or was it um, the one even before that? But anyhow, Mr. Johnson has been a lifelong rail fan and has researched many rail lines in Western Massachusetts. He's a railroad photographer, a model railroader, and is the author of The Hamden Railroad, The Greatest Railroad That Never Ran. Unsurprisingly, he is a member of several railroad groups and is a 47-year 47, 47 member of the Amherst Railway Society. He's now retired but he spent much of his work career with several Western Massachusetts companies working mostly in quality engineering or computer management roles. So let's all welcome Mr. Philip Johnson. Hello, everyone. Um, we'll, uh, we'll get started in just a moment. Uh, to answer George's question a moment ago or a query, uh, my mother graduated from Amherst High School in 1940. So you guys would know which school that was. It was uh, not the current one, obviously. <laughs> not the one the on uh, I think, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see if I can figure out how to get my screen up there. You let me know if you can see this PowerPoint now. Do I have to do anything extra or can you see my, uh, my blue screen? I do not see your blue screen. Okay. I'll find your camera. Don't remember how to, oh, share screen. There share it is. Screen. There it is. And let's go here and here. Come on. There we go. Got it. I see that. Now, most of you probably have a series of, uh, live pictures of all of us on the right hand side and there's a step of little um icons if you hide all the thumbnails which i believe is the left hand little thing you can have most of the screen be my presentation makes it much easier to see so i'll give you a moment to play with that otherwise i'm just going to get started okay um uh, george had asked me back in uh, late january at the amherst railway show at eastern states to uh possibly speak to you folks about the railroads uh, of Amherst, Massachusetts. I expanded that a little bit. I'm going in and around Amherst and I've prepared it for the Amherst Historical Society, October 20th, 2020. Okay, what I wanna talk about is the Amherst railways and trolleys. Uh, in case you're not aware, there were two separate railroad lines. The Boston and Maine, their central mass division ran east and west went all the way from Boston to Northampton, 104 miles. The Central Vermont Railway, north-south, is still in place. It ran from New London, Connecticut to White River Junction, Vermont, and probably beyond. The immediate trolley was the uh, Amherst and Sunderland trolley, although uh, later on you'll see that uh, there was another trolley. Uh, hopefully you can see my, my colorized map a little bit here. The blue lines are the railroad lines. Obviously, Amherst is that target on the right-hand side of the image. And the red lines were the trolleys. You could get almost anywhere by trolley and certainly to major cities by, by railroads. Uh, we'll start with the Boston and Maine Railroad, that east-west line I mentioned. The Central Mass Branch was completed in 1887, all the way from Boston to Northampton. Portions of this line operated anywhere from 1864, and there's actually one still operating in the east, but uh, out our way, it kind of stopped in 1983. The Amherst station is still in place, of course. It's now the farmer's supply. Oh. That line was converted from, uh, <laughs> was converted to a bike trail from Northampton to Belchertown, and, uh, I've spoken to one of the bike trail uh, enthusiasts and promoters in the area, Craig DeLapena from Northampton, and he, he tells me that um, 
they're, they've purchased land, they've got trusts and all sorts of things. They're gonna extend that bike trail, but we'll see more later. There's that Boston and Maine Depot that you may not even be able to recognize that because it's got feed and seed and all sorts of other things all stacked around it, additions made to it. But that's what it looks like once upon a time. The Boston and Maine today, um, basically the 1930s were not kind to the Boston and Maine Central Mass Line. Traffic fell off during the depression Hurricanes in the 30s caused all kinds of track damage. In 1931, there was a section from Amherst to Belchertown was abandoned. Then the B&M ran on the adjacent Central Vermont trackage. This was from Norwatuck to Canal Junction in South Belchertown. The 1938 hurricane cut the railroad in two sections, never to be joined again. Northampton and to Hardwick was that West End that, that we know so well and uh, damage to many smaller bridges caused more shared track, just like I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, anytime there was an adjacent track, they, uh, they took that over. They completely abandoned the line in 1979. The tracks were finally removed in 1983. The current rail trail was started approximately 1992. I don't have an exact date, but that certainly feels right. The rail trail, as I said, is gonna be extended through Belchertown too, soon, with the goal being the entire 105 miles. That's what Craig B. Penn is telling me. I'd love to see it. Uh, I mentioned the shared trackage in, in North Belchertown. This, the same station, the same area, we had two different names, depending on which railroad you were riding on. It was called Dwight's on the center of Vermont and Pansy Park on the Boston and Maine. And there's a picture of the Pansy Park station. I might think it's about to tap, topple over because of those big beams holding the roof still up. Looks comical to me. Um, here's that, uh, that rail trail map. I'm sure you're, you're all aware of that, but I wanted to just put it in the presentation. This is the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission's 2003 map. That's probably the most recent one I can find. I know there's an extension over on the Northampton side up, up towards Leeds a little bit. But that, that light blue line is certainly the line. And I, I biked that. And that, that's a nice ride. It's, it's rather long for me. I've got to get back in shape. But it's a nice line. <laughs> and we all need to get in shape. OK, the Central Vermont is now called the New England Central. Those are those uh, pumpkin-colored locomotives you might see running through town. That's the north-south line. It was started as the North Amherst and Belcher Town then became the New London Northern as it continued to Miller's Falls, and then connected to the Vermont portion of that line. 1847 to, to uh, 1867 was that time frame there. The Central Vermont, as it was re renamed then, arrived in about 1853 to Amherst to connect to Palmer and New London to the Brattleboro White River Junction branch. It remained as the center of Vermont from 1871 to 1995. Like I said, it's the NECR, New England Central Railroad now. The 1853 passenger station is still in place. That's that brick one that was the Amtrak stop until just recently. Passenger service con continued under the CV until 1947. <laughs> A few years of service were offered by Amtrak, but as I said, that ended at the end of 2014. I rode one of the last trains, just to say I rode it from Amherst to Springfield and, no, from uh, Brattleboro to Springfield and return, just to, uh, just to see the mileage before it went away. There was a depot in Cushman, but that was gone by 1921. That's right where that parking lot is now in that little triangle space opposite that little store. Those tracks, of course, are still in use. Freight only now, as I said, formerly used by Amtrak. I think there's uh, one train each direction each day through Amherst. Uh, later afternoon northbound, as I remember, because I see it up here at Miller's Falls sometime. It was reorganized as a New England Central in 1995, which is now owned by the Genesee and Wyoming since 2012. And as, as I said, they're now running those orange locomotives. I like the green and yellow myself, but that's, they didn't ask me. There's that station that I mentioned that we don't know so well. 
You can see this little platform and two people are sitting on the end of the platform posing for the photographer, I suppose. Um, and that the Amher sign is still there. There's a number of tracks in place. I believe they're all removed now. Huh. Um, no, it wasn't just all the um, passenger stuff. As you can see on this map, which I borrowed from the Library of Congress, it's a Sanborn business map. Passenger station is in the lower right corner, that pink station. There was a freight house a little further south of that or left in the picture. But this has all those hat plants and the Hills Brothers manufacturers of straw hats was the big manufacturer down there. And Elder Lumber was down there and the, another manufacturer up on the upper left. You know, so it wasn't all just passengers coming and going to Mass Aggie then. There was actually manufacturing in, in Amherst. And as a matter of fact, my great grandfather, George Moore, he received a shipment by rail on 3rd of October in 1855, and he paid 50 cents for this box of box, box, bundle of boxes, 100 boxes he purchased for his store in Leverett Center. Uh, this is one of those family heirlooms that just filtered down to me, but it's, it's, it's the railroad we're talking about. Okay, um, trolleys. The Amherst and Sunderland Street Railway, it ran from about 1891 to 1936 as the Amherst and Sunderland. In 1907, it became the division of the Holyoke Street Railway System as they started gobbling up all the smaller lines. There, those tracks are long since gone. They were pulled up probably shortly after the, the line stopped running. The last trolley stop, most of you are probably aware, was at Pleasant Street Station, which was, you know, in the middle of the UMass property. I believe that was North Pleasant Street. It was torn down in 2012, uh, some power line reconstruction project they were doing. That's, that's a sad loss for the town. It was the only piece, the only stop station left. Another last remnant of the system was the wooden trolley barn by Coles Lumber, and that's now gone. That was that was about to fall over last time I went past it. The last remaining piece of the system is the old trolley building, now used by the Amherst Public Works in South Pleasant Street. There's a picture of an 1897 trolley, two-man operation. One man drove it, and one man collected the tickets. And this is one of those open cars. You you climbed up those steps on the side where the man is stand, the conductor is standing. And you paid your nickel and you climbed aboard and you, you ran as far as you could. Okay, this is that wooden car barn I mentioned. Um, There's actually part of the powerhouse up there. They called it County Road. I believe that's that's right next to Coles Lumber, just north of Coles Lumber now. But that was. Uh, prominently shown in that 1910 view of another Sanborn map I borrowed from the Library of Congress. They ran up South Pre Pleasant Street, beautiful picture. You know, most of these are postcards that are common. But, you know, there we are, there's, there's Amherst. I don't know how many of you knew, but it ran up over the notch right next to uh, 119. Uh, before they realigned 119, when it hugged that left, that west side of the mountain, you could just barely see this on the right-hand side. When you got up to the top by the stone crusher, you could easily see this track off on the, on the eastern side. Uh, you can still see it today, but it's, it's a little harder to see as trees grow up. Must have been quite a ride to go up or down that hill. Now, every trolley system had their own tokens. I happen to have these from the Spring Springfield Street Railway. I don't have any from Amherst, but I don't necessarily collect them. But they're, they're small, about the size of a dime made out of a base metal, nothing, nothing significant, no cost there. But they all had their own tickets, good for one ride or one zone, depending on how the uh, payment was figured out. Now, as we, as we go off to the west, as all trolleys do and that map earlier showed, you, you want to get over to Northampton. You know, the, the bus line runs there now. These are the three bridges that existed at one time. The uh, railroad bridge is still there. That's the bike trail one now. The, um, the one of the first highway bridges and then the trolley bridge way over on the left-hand side. Now we're looking across from Hadley towards Northampton. 
So I'm, I'm guessing that trolley bridge is about where the current highway bridge is right now, but it's much higher off the river also. Um, and since we've crossed the river, there were three more railroads and another trolley system over there. The Connecticut River Railroad followed the river as it, its namesake river and arrived in Northampton about 1845. That became part of the Boston and Maine their Con River line ran from Springfield through Northampton to Brattleboro. Those tracks are still in place, used for freight, and the, the, the Amtrak and the, the New Valley Flyer runs on that now, a station in Northampton. The, the original station is now open as a restaurant. It was designed by H.H. H. Richardson, who designed several area railroad stations, always built of stone to last forever. Um, Built about 1896 or seven, using uh, that blonde brick and long meadow limestone, good stuff. This station replaced two separate smaller depots. They were wooden depots that the railroads had to get rid of when the railroads were elevated to eliminate grade crossings, very dangerous grade crossings of railroads and roads. Uh, the b &M Central Mass Line came over from Amherst and Hadley, met just east of the current station in about 1887. Here's a view of that current station that you can see now. The tracks in front of us are now gone. That's part of another bike trail. The live tracks are on the opposite side of the station, extreme right side. And you can see some carriages are pulled up there, probably waiting people about to um, disembark from the train. This is a map. I know it doesn't show it real well, but that station is that um, odd shaped blob, pink blob in the lower center of that picture. The tracks we were just standing on in the previous slide are that lower left corner. They came up in parallel, the long uh, passenger uh, boarding area to the north of the station. Strong Avenue still there, of course. Another Library of Congress map. Now the New Haven line is the one we were just standing on take in that postcard picture. That ran from Northampton, the New Haven to Northampton and followed an old canal built in the 1840s and 50s. There's very little left on any of that line to show it was ever a canal. It followed, then it followed the Con Connecticut River Railroad to the industrial area in Turner's Falls and added two branch lines to smaller communities. Just uh, where Stop and Shop is now, they branched off and went over to Williamsburg. And in uh, South Deerfield area, there was another branch off, went over to Sh Shelburne Falls area. And they, they ended up in uh, what is now East Deerfield Yard, sharing yard space with the Boston and Maine. All those branch line tracks are gone. There's a bike trail, like as I said earlier, going out towards Williamsburg. So some of it is still in use. You can still see some of it. As I recall, there's still a little piece right by Look Park that you can see over there. There's a little arch bridge you can drive through or used to be able to. Now here's a map of that era I was talking about. Uh, if you follow those, those hashed marks on the bottom right side, those are the railroad tracks. That line that makes a sharp right turn and goes off to the right, off the right side of the map is that central mass line, runs over to Amherst Belchertown, and eventually 105 miles later to Boston. The Boston to Maine, the current line is that right-hand one that goes north-south. The New Haven line, I said, is gone, is that one slightly west of that. That angle running up off the left upper left corner, that's the branch to Williamsburg. Went past the vet's hospital, ser served them coal for years, went up to uh, Williamsburg to that lovely brick station that still exists up there. Now, there was a number of buildings associated with that line. This is their freight station in Northampton, quite a large facility. The staff is all lined up to get their picture taken. Now, there was all, as I said, there's another trolley over there. It's called the Northampton and Amherst. Service in Northampton area was connected to Amherst approximately 1900. It ran along the current Route 9, as we saw on that three bridge map earlier, all the way over to Amherst Center where you could exchange to the other trolley line. That's that trolley bridge that ran across into Connecticut River. 
pretty much the trolley business came in to replace all those stages, stage coaches. So the electric trolleys replaced them about 1893-ish, 1880s to 1900, that whole time, double decade there. They also, that was also taken over by the Holyoke Street Railway. As I said, they gobbled up all those smaller lines in 1907. Most of that service was gone in October 1922, replaced by rubber tire buses. Sad loss. Now here's another view of that Con River Valley. The B&M lines are all shown in red. This one unfortunately doesn't show that central Vermont line. It, it's, it's just a, a pencil line because it's a B&M map. Um, I wanted to show you the, a larger picture of the, the whole area. Um, at, at one time, they, there was a bypass built in 1913, the, the little yellow arrows pointing at that, to connect the central mass line directly into Springfield and not have to change trains at Northampton and uh, get you to travel south to New York. This was at Hampton Railroad, the one that I wrote the book about. Basically, it wanted to get people from the rich areas of New York and southwestern Connecticut up to the, the vacation lands in uh, New Hampshire and Maine. So we'll make this connection and get them, uh, get them headed more north. But as I said, the Hamden Railroad, the greatest railroad that never ran. My book tells the entire story about that line. You can get it from me or Federal Street Brooks and Greenfield has a couple. Amazon, other online sellers. And uh, there's, there's some really good reference books. Um, if you don't have it, The Railroads and Trolleys of Amherst, Mass. by James Avery Smith. You can buy that right from the Amherst Railway website. Uh, One Town and Seven Railroads, written by the Palmer Public Library Railroad Advisory Board in 2008. I consulted on that a little bit. I think you have to see the Palmer Public Library. I'm not sure if that's available outside the library system. Uh, also, the Central Mass Railroad is written by the uh, Boston Main Railroad Historical Society, printed by Marker Press. Those are available around also. Good reference books if, if you want to read further on your area. All right. Well, thank you for your attention. This didn't go as long as I expected. It's, it's going well. Um, all images used in this presentation are out of copyright and or in my personal collection. Sanborn maps are found at the Library of Congress, and I noted that the, those were Sanborn maps. Uh, I think we can open to questions anytime. Uh, you can email me later if you think of questions later on down the road at hamdenphil at gmail.com. So I'll leave it back to you, George, and we'll uh, entertain questions. I'm going to well, start, stop, stop my share now. <laughs> there we go. Yes, um, thank you for that presentation. And one question that I had was about trolleys. Were the original trolleys horse-drawn before they became electric? It's not, not likely they were horse-drawn up here because putting in the rails themselves was a big cost. Not mm -hmm. you know, Obviously, you've, you've got to build the power plant and the string wires, but that, that was more in the larger cities, you know, Boston and New York. I believe they were just the traditional stage coaches that we all think of um, before the the electric trolleys came in. I don't think we had the the horse drawn ones here. My grandfather, who graduated from Amherst in 1916, used to talk about um, taking the stagecoach back from Northampton mm -hmm. late at night. So they were probably still running as as late as. Um, what you know the into the teens sure the teens? no it's well if they were competing companies there would be no reason to stop running until you had a loss of ridership mm -hmm. you know and it could be that the trolleys shut off at nine o'clock at night i don't know what you know there's, there's not a lot of records survive of trolley services <laughs> not like railroad timetables that are around mm -hmm. forever trolleys ran until the the riders stopped you know and They'd have to run the power plant or buy municipal power to keep them running. So they would certainly did not run all night.
So we would have had a power plant in town too to uh, keep the electric trolleys running. Well, one of those pictures showed what was supposedly a power plant up by Coles Lumber. Uh huh. So you would uh, probably burn coal to make steam to run a generator. Uh, also, the Amherst DPW down there on Route 9, that was also a power plant. So I don't know why they would have two. It wasn't a large system, but they were both noted as being power plants at some point in their life cycle. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, you'd either buy municipal power or you'd have your own power plant. Many of the smaller small town trolleys, like up here, Conway and uh, um, Shelburne Falls, they had a water power power plant. So they had a generator at the bottom of the, the waterfall and they would make their own power, mm -hmm. which then, you know, they would just, I suppose, just shut it off, you know, when, when the trolley stopped running for the day. Does someone else have questions? Bill, Eliza. Elisa, actually, Elisa. but yes. Elisa. Uh, two, two comments. One. I came in 1970 and I have a dim recollection of D&M tracks next to the farmer's supply. I mean, they weren't being used, but they were still visible at that point. Yes, so, In the 70s, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 I've seen a picture of one of the last freight trains that ran across uh -huh. the Con River Bridge. In my mind, I have it stuck that that was like 1973. Really? You know, and they ran over to, there was a customer in Hadley near where that little bike shop, an ice cream oh, shop oh, yeah. is now. Right. You know, yeah. and they probably ran a boxcar every now and then down to Farmer Supply with grain and such things. Sure, okay, yeah, so very seldom though. Right, okay. The other thing, I used to yeah. take the Vermont or Montreal or whatever it was called <laughs> from yeah. Amherst to Washington with some frequency back when it was still coming yeah. through Amherst. And, it was delightful to get on the train and you just, you've got your seat and you're all set for the next eight hours or whatever, but you didn't have to, <laughs> you didn't have to change cars or anything, which was very nice. I loved it. Yeah. If personally, I prefer rail traffic to airplanes. I, oh, yeah. airplanes, it's the only way to get there in, in a timely manner when I go out West for anything, but the railroads are relaxing. You can sit, you can read a book, you can sit and have a coffee, stare out the window, get up and walk around. You can't right. do much of that on a plane. Exactly. Much more relaxing. I, I envy people who got to take that chance. Of course, now you'd have to get a get a car over to Northampton and get yes. on the, the Amtrak. Right. I believe they're running because of the COVID. But uh, you know, once it once the world opens up back again, you know, the trains will start running again. If they get a budget from Congress to keep them going, but anyway. Well, there's always that battle. <laughs> My wife is from Nebraska, and for a while she was taking the train from Springfield out to Lincoln, Nebraska, yep. and you'd get a sleeping berth and everything. Oh, and sure. She thought it was a very civilized way to travel. She met some wonderful people while she was doing that. Are oh, there yeah. other questions? I don't see any hands, hands up, so, oh, oh wait, Carolyn. <laughs> Turn your mic on, Carolyn. Yeah. Did that yeah. do it? There. Well, I used to cross-country ski um, along the trolley line. Well, the Epsteins owned that property, Seymour and Alice, uh, to the east of Route 116 going up over the notch. Oh. And it was just, it was very, it wasn't that steep, really. I mean, the fact that I could ski it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I went up. It was very. It was still open then. Uh, this would have been the 80s and the 90s. Okay. Um, and um, and it was very very visible on the other side of the notch, actually. The, on the north side. On yeah. the south side. South side, yeah. Mm -hmm. The north side, it was kind of in the woods. Yeah, but, I think so. Yeah. It's as I said, to, it was skiable, and it was privately yeah. owned. I uh, I don't know if that's um, I suppose it would be privately owned, right? But it, it's hard to know exactly what happens to the rail, to the the property, the land itself, when mm -hmm. uh, it, when it's abandoned. Depends on the legality of the abandonment. If they just put it dormant and walk away, and then the corporation folds, 
the ownership of the land is in question, but I'm not a lawyer, so I don't know for sure. But um, it's my understanding a lot of that land can revert back to the previous owners after X number of years. You know, that, mm -hmm. that's just how I understand it. Because uh, there's certainly no nobody they would need to buy it back from because the corporation's gone. Pretty sure in the Holyoke Range, it's part of the Holyoke Range State Park. I'm, I'm sure, now, Eliza, now, now that, that's probably true now. That's probably part of Holyoke Range, the, the state property there. Uh, possibly some of the um, the Trap Rock people, I believe that's Lane or somebody. Yeah, they probably right. they probably own that that little piece east of 116, right at the at the mill there. Yeah. Yeah, and I too remember the train going to Amherst Farm Supply mm -hmm. sure. in the seventies, and then uh, going back. And when it stopped, I was always I was very very surprised. But for uh, to get anywhere on train at that point had to go over to Northampton. Right. And get a train then in the 70s and 80s. Right. And then, then that, that Con River line I mentioned got so deteriorated because the, the operating company deferred maintenance for so many years that it Amtrak wouldn't trust that at 10 miles an hour. So like that's why they moved over camera. and started coming coming down through Miller's Falls and Amherst to Palmer and then reverse direction and go back to Springfield. Mm -hmm. They did that many years. Do you, th do you think the railroads were, I mean, Amherst had three railroads coming through at one point or two, two anyway. Two. Was that mostly because of the factories? Um, well, north, south, they had to come through there somewhere. Uh -huh. and so why not? Yeah. Okay. Well, you kind of pick the larger towns because it's more likely business freight and passenger business in the larger towns. When they all started out, the, there were many um, inducements. Sometimes the town would have to pay the railroad company to go to their town rather than the town next door. Uh -huh. you know, but they also have to consider the terrain you want to follow right. where you don't have a lot of cost to put the railroad in. Um, the north-south route was was fairly obvious. They wanted to stay away from the Con River line. They wanted to get the head more easterly rather than through Springfield, so they headed more east to get to New London. The east-west line that was just to get to from Northampton to Boston. That was laid out in eighteen eighties, whatever sixties. You know, they just wanted to run that whole line. So it was a matter of where do you go. You know. If, in in my own mind, they got a they got a heads up years and years before Quabbin came because they made a dip and went south around Quabbin because otherwise they would have had to pull their tracks up and relay it all when Quabbin mm -hmm. stole those four towns from us. Amherst has a station road in South Amherst that is crossed yes. by crossed by the active railroad and the rail trail where they were both very close together. Was there ever a station there? Uh, I think that may be that that uh, rickety little station I, I showed up as Pansy Park or Dwight's. There, there was a station on that road. Oh, okay. So that that was in Amherst, not Belchertown, actually, maybe. Yeah, yeah, in Amherst. There, there was, today we might call it South Amherst Station, but yeah. back then they always named it for somebody prominent with the railroad or some industrialist or so, some funny name. A lot of uh, Native American names were used. Narwa Talk Junction, things like that. Yeah, the, Dick the Dickinson family was uh, yeah. quite uh, involved in getting the railroad to come through Amherst. The, oh. the uh, north, the, the one that went by the Dickinson homestead, very near. The north there. South Line. <laughs> yeah. Central Bond, yeah. <laughs> So I imagine a little money. Um, there was money changed hands. <laughs> to help bring that line in. Certainly. Oh, Wonderly's iPad. I see a hand up. <laughs> Hello. Uh, uh, in the nineties, in Willimantic, there were some people trying to make a railroad museum, and they had made the uh, turnaround thing and everything. And they they got a they they got a car, and sent it. And we 
we paid tickets and got on and we rode up up the uh up what's called 32 in, in yeah in connecticut up 32 up to amherst and you could get off in amherst if you wanted to but then we went up to brattleboro and had yeah. lunch and turned around and came back down again and we stopped at an amherst station there yeah because people got on off i think maybe some people got on i don't remember exactly but yeah. that was a lot of fun we wanted them to do it again and they said <laughs> they never had that much money again <laughs> <laughs> well it's, it's sometimes there are uh, charter trains there's a there's a group out of the boston area mass bay railroad enthusiasts and they will charter a train for a day and run such a thing uh i've ridden out of uh worcester you know several times on the, Pro the providence and worcester line they've, they've got quite a passenger train they or they used to and uh but that that museum you mentioned down there that that's an active museum they they did build the turntable was the word you're thinking yes, of the turn the turn the yes. they built great. they rebuilt the round they rebuilt the roundhouse using the original plan so they have a six stall roundhouse to store equipment in yes they did and, and they that. have yes. a beautiful museum i got down there well not not this year but every other year for the past 15 years i've gone down there for a a photo shoot where they stage things for us and it's it's a wonderful uh, time. It's a beautiful museum. Yeah, that I'm glad. I'm glad they got it together. It was just starting out. We used to go uh, out and buy a T-shirt and spend the day <laughs> walking around. <laughs> yeah. Anyone else? Well, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, this video, a, a slightly edited version, leaving out all of the golly, how does this work comments, <laughs> um, will be posted up on, um, on Amherst Media's website and also linked by Amherst History's website. Um, and I'll probably feature it in an up upcoming Amherst History Newsgram. So um, anyone who's not here now, who didn't get to see it, will get to see it in the future. Uh, thank you again for your time.